Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 37, November 29th through December 5th, 1861. Last week, we stopped very briefly in Florida before spending most of our time discussing the Black Hawk War. Hopefully now, we have a better understanding for some of the experiences, at least, that shaped, in part, Abraham Lincoln, as well as Jefferson Davis, among others. This week, we will actually round out our Mexican War discussion and take a look at takeaways and experiences from that conflict. I think there are a good handful of officers at the time, junior officers, who had varying experiences that helped to sculpt the way in which they act during the American Civil War. We have already mentioned how Winfield Scott was a great source of inspiration. We will discuss that again in the takeaways, of course. Even though we said goodbye to Winfield Scott, we never really say goodbye, I suppose. It should also be pointed out that this would be, for many, their sole military experience. Even if we have those who served on the frontier, I think we have gone over enough of the smaller scale engagements to illustrate that Mexico would be, for many, more relevant, at least for larger scale operations. And certainly, in terms of conventional warfare, right, there was a lot of hit-and-run fast-moving tactics and actions that happen against the Native Americans on the frontier that don't really translate very well to the Civil War. There are some key examples of those who really have primarily cavalry experience, and they try to treat infantry the same way, and it doesn't really work out very well in the end. We can take at least a little bit of time to go over some of the names and mention a few items about them and their time serving under Taylor and Scott. First, let's take a look at the leadership core of the Confederacy in Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee. We've mentioned that Jefferson Davis wanted to be a real military commander rather than president. His time serving in Mexico goes a long way toward this attitude. He has a little chip on his shoulder after the war because he does perform well. We talked about how Zachary Taylor admits fault in his conceptions about Davis marrying his daughter. I would place forward an argument that Davis would also use this experience combined with his time serving as Secretary of War as experience that there needed to be a sort of technological advantage when facing an inferior enemy. We have highlighted the outdated armaments used by Mexico as detrimental toward their success. The Confederacy would seek better arms from across the pond, but the Union blockade did not allow for much in terms of purchasing. There was definitely more of a willingness to invest time and resources in ironclads and try out-of-the-box ideas like a submarine. We'll talk about the CSS Hunley later in the Civil War here, later in our time, but should be noted, and I think we've talked about it a little bit more in depth at our naval episodes, that if the Confederate Navy was not going to be able to produce as many vessels as the United States Navy, and certainly I think nobody was under that illusion that they were ever going to match the numbers, at least they were going to be able to produce something that was, in a technological sense, more superior than the wooden vessels that comprised most of the Navy at the time. So maybe Davis would have drawn from his experience, having used the Mississippi rifles, which were, at least at that time, at least more on the cutting edge of things. 
During his time in the Army, Jefferson Davis would form a friendship with Braxton Bragg, as we've already mentioned. Bragg's artillery would support his Mississippi rifles. Of course, as we've already mentioned, Bragg would be disliked by almost everyone except Jefferson Davis. Robert E. Lee, on the other hand, sees his star have a very advantageous rise. As mentioned, being a captain at 40 was less than ideal. It was seen as a bit too old for that rank. Lee would play a large part in leading the U.S. troops in two separate engagements. This would catch the attention of his superiors and most likely elevate his status, whereas he had been rather stagnant prior to the war. He would take to heart the lessons that Winfield Scott would impart upon him. Those lessons would, of course, be very Napoleonic and include strong interior lines, as we've already mentioned. Lee would use these twice in 1864 in two famous situations, the first being a near disaster at Spotsylvania and second more successfully at North Anna. Both situations included a defensive position at angles, which are great for terms of logistics and resupply, but also fairly dangerous if, say, the line is broken. Scott was also aggressive when it came to the battlefield. Lee is often criticized for being defensive, but if we take a deeper look at the engagements he fights and combine with the overall Confederate war strategy, then we may find this to be false. There are plenty of times Lee takes the fight to the enemy. Probably most famously, he has a very aggressive and large flanking maneuver at Chancellorsville, which to some consider to be Lee's finest hour. It's also a situation where he divides his army in the face of his superior numbers, certainly something that if you had a purely defensive strategy, you probably wouldn't do, right? It doesn't make any sense to move some of your men away in a position where one or both of your forces could potentially be annihilated, right? Lee also invades the North twice during the war, right? Something that is not really in the grand scheme of things for Jefferson Davis and the Confederacy. They really want to hold on to the territory they already have and protect the states who are in the Confederacy rather than gain any territory. So just the mere fact that Lee is able to convince Davis to agree to this plan, uh, I think shows his aggression. The diplomatic skill that Scott shows is not lost on the Confederate commander. As mentioned, he is able to navigate in the army as well as with Jefferson Davis, something that other generals did not accomplish, right? Joseph Johnson is a great example of someone who does not get along with Jefferson Davis. Um, but certainly, I think something we also have to think about is that a lot of the subordinate generals in the rebel army, they are used to being more independent. They're not really used to being told what to do or having tight discipline. So uh, Lee is able to gain control without necessarily alienating those under his command, which is going to be something that speaks well towards general cohesion of the army. This may be a little too far of a reach, but I'd also put forward that Scott, much like Lee, understands when the conflict is over. President Polk, during the war, wants to press for more territory, perhaps throwing the country back into open combat with the Mexican people. That's something that Scott obviously does not want to have happen. We talked about it in our rundown of the Mexican-American War. Lee also does not disperse his army and move to join Joseph Johnson in North Carolina. I think he understands when the writing is on the wall and the war is over. There are even more situations where I think Lee, among others, including, say, McClellan, uh, 
and Beauregard, who serve with Scott, uh, really, really glean from their experience, even down to the staff makeup. You know, Scott has a very Napoleonic style staff. He relies on these engineers, likely, to sort of guide the army, right? And there is sort of an emphasis we see from Lee and, and his staff and who he chooses to to have with him. You know, there are other generals who decide they want to have family members, sort of a spoil system of sorts, right? We talked about the spoil system and talking about the Black Hawk War, um, but Lee is more interested in having talent, much like Scott. Now, let's take a look at Ulysses S. Grant. Grant's letters home are well documented. Despite showing bravery and skill and leadership, he would not like his time serving in Mexico. Oftentimes, he would write about the bleak state of the troops, including Taylor's army, immediately prior to their invasion into northern Mexico. The future winning general would not paint himself to be the bloodthirsty villain that he's often portrayed as by his critics. These critics, I would like to point out, are often lost cause narratives who point out the fact that Grant bests Lee only because he throws more men into the meat grinder. We are some ways off from 1864, but I hope we can illustrate this misconception is not entirely true. I would argue, however, that the experience at Monterey may have helped to shape Grant's later war strategy. In that engagement, a smaller force of American troops lays siege to the city. After some hard fighting, at times house to house, the Mexican troops are pushed back to the citadel. At this point, the Americans are forced to offer terms because the Mexicans still outnumber them. Grant may have seen this and was inspired that he needed to maintain larger numbers in order to defeat an enemy ready to dig in and defend their home soil. The leadership style of Zachary Taylor is impressive to Grant. Taylor, as mentioned, was very informal, called rough and ready versus old fuss and feathers. That's what Winfield Scott was known as. He was also able to remain calm on the battlefield. This is a skill Grant uses to great effect in the Civil War. We have already mentioned how when Confederate reinforcements close in on him at Belmont, he's not panic and instead is able to form an orderly retreat. When we get into 1862, we will see this again at Fort Donaldson and Shiloh, this sort of coolness under fire. Grant is also very much like Taylor in that he is informal. You know, he's not from this higher level of aristocracy like, say, some of the southern generals are. We can also mention George Gordon Meade and Stonewall Jackson. George Meade was part of the topographical engineer forces. He is also attached to Taylor's army in the north and experiences the horrors of combat. I would say that Meade gets great combat experience when it comes to the use of terrain in battle. This will become important when it comes to Gettysburg in 1863. Meade had actually left the military to become a civil engineer prior to the war. The Mexican-American War would get Meade back into the army, where he will serve all the way up until the outbreak of hostilities. He continues to perform engineering duties and even helps in the construction of those defenses around Washington. I think Meade is a great example of someone whose military career is propelled due to the conflict. Thomas Jackson is able to obtain a coolness under fire as well. At Buena Vista, a cannonball narrowly misses the future Confederate Major General. This is a particular incident I wanted to highlight from his time in Mexico that perhaps is a little bit of a black mark on his record. In the taking of Mexico City, Jackson's artillery fires on Mexican lancers who are moving across a bridge. Civilians are caught in the crossfire, but Jackson will continue with his pieces. When writing about the incident afterwards, 
Jackson would show very little remorse in potential civilian casualties. I think this is sort of interesting in the future mindset of Jackson, and maybe dispels some of the generally positive press he receives through books and movies like, say, Gods and Generals. Jackson does have somewhat of a fanatical sense that the Southern cause is just and right. This same cause is also supported to be correct by the divine, and this could be an early form of this kind of attitude displayed through a younger man. Maybe I'm off on some of this stuff, but it is still an interesting thought. Much like Meade, Jackson is able to rise because of the Mexican-American War. He has a really tough life beforehand. Well, he's actually passed up when it comes to the appointment to West Point uh, for somebody else from, at that time, Western Virginia, right? Um, but when that individual drops out of the military academy, Jackson is able to take his place. So he's sort of always fighting this uphill battle. He also makes relationships with officers in the Mexican-American War. Jackson was known for being awkward and very quiet. So he's able to form certain relationships that are going to be important when the American Civil War breaks out. We mentioned in our episode about the Mexican-American War, the assault on Chapultepec toward the end of the conflict. During this assault, there are many future officers involved. James Longstreet, George Pickett, Louis Armistead, Joseph E. Johnson, John Bankhead Magruder, and Bernard B., to name a few, see action. Longstreet actually was wounded and handed the company colors he was carrying to his future subordinate, Pickett. I think a big takeaway from the war in general is that relationships are formed between the junior officers that may carry over into the Civil War. We just talked about that with Jackson. I guess we can also say that rivalries are formed in that sense as well. At Appomattox, Grant mentions to Lee about how he meets him during the war, but Lee admittedly says he doesn't remember Grant sort of uh, awkward there, right? Magruder would be a founding member of the Aztec Club, formed for officers who had served during Scott's movements from Veracruz to Mexico City. This can show there is a strong sense of camaraderie amongst these men that would continue even after the war. I want to also take some time to talk about West Point and the significance of time spent there by many of the attendees. So as we have highlighted, many of the officers so far in our story have been West Pointers. In the modern age, you go to college and there is a large mixing of ideas and peoples who could attend. You might have people from all across the country as well as foreign students. In the mid-1800s, this was probably not the case very often. Geography, economic status, race, all of these would be barriers for those going to university. West Point was by no means reminiscent of a modern university, but it was a place where there could be at least some mixing of culture. Southern plantation owners' sons could mingle with northern elites. There were also those who obtained sponsorship to attend, so not always the extremely wealthy were the sole cadets. So this was important to point out and may have added to potential knowledge of generals on both sides as well as the building of these already mentioned relationships. As far as takeaways, I think the obvious one is that there would have to be an expanded military presence as a result of territorial expansion. The newly acquired areas would put the American military in conflict with native peoples, like we mentioned in talking about the Apache and Navajo. We can also see through Winfield Scott in his campaign to take Mexico City, there is an emphasis on operations in a hostile country and logistical support. Scott has an army of about 12,000. This was a large army for the time, but it was not really a huge force compared to the armies of the Civil War. Because his army is on the smaller size, he is greatly outnumbered compared to the entire Mexican force that is laid against him. <laughs> 
There are also many problems with supply lines and bandits. After the capture of Mexico City, the only American casualties, besides those dying from illness, are being picked off by bandits. Speaking of the illness piece, I think it's interesting that in terms of casualty total numbers, the Mexican War does not rank high on the list of American wars. It does, however, in terms of percentage of those engaged. There are some 13,000 deaths in the U.S. military throughout the conflict, more than the total number of Scott's army. But I digress. Being able to successfully have a smaller occupying army in enemy territory was impressive on behalf of Scott, and the officers serving under him would learn. Not agitating the civilian and potential partisan population was important. Scott took great pains to make sure that there was discipline among his troops, especially the volunteers. Being able to protect logistical lines was also of high importance, as we have already talked about. I think that Civil War officers would learn about how to lead volunteer troops, and more importantly, how to train them in order to be effective soldiers. Mistrust of the presence and an awareness of public opinion could have been gleaned from the war with Mexico as well. We see that the enthusiasm wanes for the war. This is based off of the atrocities committed against civilians, combined with politics, and views that the expansion in general was unjust. It's sort of telling there are very few monuments dedicated to the Mexican-American War, and certainly there is not one in Washington, D.C. The cooling of war fever would derail the war effort, something that would not sit well for soldiers who fought. We see in the Civil War generals like Sherman, who were not fans of the press, an interesting measure was on the home front, wives of the soldiers were urged not to spread the seeds of dissension. A letter would be published in the Confederate press written by Robert E. Lee that has words to this effect. Whether Lee actually wrote the letter is debatable. What is not is the wish of the Confederacy to shut down negative waves. Let's go over some attitudes of the soldiers serving during the war. Specifically, I want to mention their attitudes toward desertion and duty. I think if anyone has listened to our first Patreon episode, you will note that these attitudes are something that fascinate me, and hopefully you find the subject matter interesting too. We really cannot point to X and say that led to Y definitively for a large group of soldiers, right? When talking about this stuff, there are just many examples that are given to us that show a bit of a trend to them. So the following observations I have seen made through a variety of sources. First, I would like to point out in the writings of Confederate and Union soldiers a differing attitude toward the war effort and the opposing side. Union writing is more critical in terms of the Union war effort and would be ultimately more complementary of their opposing side. Confederates, on the other hand, would not be so disparaging toward their own performances, and they would take a more hardline attitude toward federal forces. Why was this? Well, there are several reasons. The first is there was a more honor-bound, chivalric approach in the South than that in the North. For instance, defeats were not highlighted, and many rebels even wrote about how they would lick the Federals, even to the very doors of the McLean House at Appomattox. In the larger defeats, there were more antidotes of the misadventures of Union forces or their poor performance in certain parts of the engagement. Union troops seemed to have more of a battlefield bond with their southern counterparts. Many of them had admiration for their valiant performances, even in the face of overwhelming odds especially as the war started to draw to a close and supplies ran low, there were accounts of Union soldiers being impressed. We talked about that in our Frank Wilkinson review, as a matter of fact. I think this can also be drawn up to the fact that conquest was not key, but rather the restoration of the Union 
was a main goal for even the rank and file. Not so for the Confederacy. If you remember, there was often a depiction of the northern soldiers as these great invaders. Most of the battles, as previously talked about, were on southern soil. This could be a good example of why the Confederates were not so keen to hand out compliments to their enemy. I want to also mention the attitude of Civil War soldiers toward desertion and battlefield performance. Coffee grinders, skulks, shirkers were all present in the army and were widely disliked. Desertion, on the other hand, was a bit different. Many soldiers still did not wish to be viewed as leaving the army because they were cowards. In fact, one source I saw has a scenario where a soldier plans out a return trip home, but then cancels plans when there is a word the town has already thought he jumped ship. Such a weird sort of dynamic. Soldiers, especially from rural areas, will return home out of fear no one was taking care of their families. This was a reason that did not forsake the cause, but as you could imagine, was a powerful motivator. You combine that with the less than exciting lives they lived in camp, and there's a recipe for disaster. Some soldiers even did not understand when they were punished by the army because they had every intention to return. Toward the end of the war, there are bounty jumpers, especially on behalf of the North, who would leave for obvious monetary and self-preservation reasons. Both sides had conscripts who were not keen to fight. In the North, these individuals were often immigrants who had even less of a reason to fight. Those soldiers who did stay and fight were keen to turn out good performance on the battlefield. There are many cases where individuals are brought to trial, even in some cases for battlefield misconduct. Unfortunately, there could possibly be political motivation toward accusations of cowardice or shirking of duty. I think it is important to understand these kinds of examples and sentiments because they may not necessarily be what we think about when picturing Civil War soldiers. Let's leave things right there. Turns out this lighter week actually saw a good amount of discussion. A little removed from our original talk, we went over some main points from the War with Mexico. We went a little more in depth with some battlefield experiences, and while these were definitely not all of them, they were a good sample for us. Closing it out, we have a little more about the mentality of the common soldier. Next week, we will head back out to Oklahoma for the continuing campaign on that territory. We also check back in on Western Virginia. Seems kind of weird. We have not been there for quite a while. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, as well as a link to the Patreon and Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show would be greatly appreciated. Feedback is welcome. Question, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week. <laughs>